Be here, brother. Uh, Pastor Josh already laid out for everybody what we're going to do. This started yesterday morning. I'm teaching mornings here on uh, roughly the theme of the Building Thereupon book that uh, brother Josh has already taught you guys a lot out of. But the key with this thing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that you know I started as a you know saved guy, saved kid, got backslidden, and so when I came to the back to the Bible. Um, it started making sense to me because I was reading it and I was getting good teaching. And the more I went, the more I realized how bad things were. And what I noticed was that if somebody doesn't get a handle on what exactly they got when they got saved, but I mean all of the different uh, actions that the Lord took when you trusted Christ as your Savior, that eventually that's going to lead somebody, that ignorance will lead somebody off into false doctrine. And so the first thing we talked about and we'll be talking about in general is the standing of a Christian. The standing of a Christian has to do with your position in Christ. It has to do with what God did for you. And again, 33 or 34, depending on how you count them, transactions that God actually imparted to you when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Uh, is as simple for you as, as putting your faith and trust in Him. It's like a deer rifle, you know, you pull the trigger on it and uh, then a bunch of stuff happens in a, in a hurry. Well, instantly when you trusted Christ as your Savior, God did, by my count anyway, you may categorize them different, 33 or 34 things. First of all, all these things guarantee individually eternal security. Each and every one of these things is irreversible, okay? And they give you a standing in Christ. And we're talking, that's what we're talking about. Now that's Put in opposition to state. Your standing in Christ never changes once you're saved. Now your state changes by the uh, month, week, day, hour, minute, second. Uh, how you're doing in your prayer life today will affect your state. Whether you're sick or not, those sort of things. Whether you're in trouble, whether you're uh, fighting with the IRS, whether you're fighting with your wife, whatever, that's your state. And you can make your state uh, pretty miserable by mistakes that you make and sins that you commit and crops that you sow. But you now, if you're saved, cannot change your standing in Christ. The devil can't change your standing in Christ. We looked yesterday, and we're going through this in some detail, so i got to shut up here uh, about just introducing it. Now, first of all, the first thing we're looking at is in Christ. There's some more categories, a handful of categories. We looked at the new creature in Christ, and we looked at how you're baptized into Jesus Christ spiritually. So right away you see everybody that goes off onto water baptism as some function of salvation is off, okay? You're saved by being placed in Christ spiritually, and baptism, water baptism, uh, reflects what happened to you. You were buried under the wrath of God in death and raised to walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ. So if somebody doesn't get that baptism right, right away, you're off. The uh, Church of Christ, the Catholics, the Lutherans, the Protestants in general, Presbyterians, Methodists, they all practice a function of baptism, not right. They sprinkle, most of them. And what that's all about is that they think that baptism somehow initiates you in. Well, baptism does save, but it's spiritual baptism that saves. And that's irreversible. That's inviolable. You can't turn back on it because the Lord did that. So, again, the, the spiritual baptism in Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, promises you eternal security. So let me uh, keep going here before we uh, go deeper. Look in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Now, a native to this study is understood that what we're dealing with is God's holy words. In other words, each of these things described is a different function. Uh, folks, uh, in general, as I explained yesterday, fundamentalism, those evangelical uh, factions, the mainstream Christian factions, that still believe in salvation in some form, because they've adopted new Bibles and so on, uh, they tend to generalize terms. I mean, some will use the, you know, saved, uh, that sort of thing. But you're far more than just forgiven. Yeah. 
you're far more than just quote unquote saved. You're redeemed. Uh, your sins have been remitted. You're justified. All these things are different uh, actions. Uh, born again, circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, seated in heavenly places in Christ. We'll hit all these. But the emphasis here is that God places uh, his, uh, his wording upon these things. They each mark something different. In general, Christians just consider themselves, quote unquote, forgiven. Or maybe some of them even use the word saved, but they have no idea how that all breaks down. If you don't know how it breaks down, then you're, you're ignorant and you need to learn. So Colossians chapter 1, there's another word here. We've used the word, a new creature, of course, in Christ. We've talked about being baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. You didn't feel that. Colossians chapter 1, and notice verse 13. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. I started early because uh, verse 14 is what I want. I would point out to you that being delivered and being uh, translated are also different actions. In verse 14, in whom we have redemption, that's the focus here for the moment. Okay, redemption. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, again, uh, if you go to a new Bible, you're going to find that Colossians 1.14 is probably not there. At least the blood is not there. And the reason why is folks have lost the idea, they have lost a connection with the fact that redemption is a specific action, okay? It's different than remission. Let me take you all the way back, if I could, to uh, uh, Exodus chapter 34, Exodus 34. But you have redemption in Christ. And while it does... Uh, involve and fold forgiveness, that much is true. It also is something else. Exodus chapter 34. And go on down to, if I can get to the right page, Exodus 34, notice down in verse 7. Exodus, Exodus 34, 7. Now here's the Lord. This is Old Testament. Exodus is the heart of the law. Is that right? They're keeping mercy for thousands. That's God. He keeps mercy for thousands. He keeps mercy for even lost people. Um, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So here you have an Old Testament case under law where somebody is forgiven, but their sins are not cleared. Okay? Now, then in the Old Testament, that's known as the remission of sins, okay? But your sins have been redeemed, we, in whom we have redemption through His blood. In the Old Testament, uh, this points out, by the way, that, there's, that salvation is different age to age. So right away, there's another huge heresy that we're guilty of because people don't understand their Bibles, and they refuse to believe what they read. Fundamentalists are very bad about that. But the idea is that in the Old Testament, the Lord set up a, a system of sacrifices and laws and statutes and uh, or, ordained things that if you kept those things, then you were in good standing with God. Where you failed, you brought the blood of the lamb, the blood of the dove, that sort of thing, and you would be right with God. But it's temporary because sins are not redeemed until Jesus Christ comes dies for our sins, sheds God's blood. God's blood was never shed till Jesus Christ died on Calvary. And so salvation was different. Here you have people that were forgiven, but it wasn't the permanent forgiveness that we have. Their sins weren't redeemed. Christ sent folks, uh, and this is, a, a, again, a broad sweep, uh, a broad doctrinally, but the Lord didn't send Old Testament saints straight to heaven. He sent them to Abraham's bosom where paradise was because they had to wait until the blood of the lamb was slain, Amen. That, that was slain, was shed. Then he rose from the dead, ascended up on high, led captivity captive, Amen. gave gifts to men. So again, this is a thing where uh, even Bible-believing so-called fundamentalists don't get it, and they don't want to get it because it goes against what their schools taught them, 
It goes against a lot of things that they've heard and understand and by men that they respect. And so I'm really sorry, but doctrine's doctrine. Okay? But in, in Colossians, again, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so you have redemption in Jesus Christ. Your sins are completely paid for. You're not just forgiven. The slate's just not wiped clean. The judge just didn't just forgive you and let you walk out of court free. Your sins are paid for. Amen. Go back to Col um, uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. And when you start studying these terms, then things start broadening and you start realizing that God's doctrine is enfolded, layered one upon another. And if you don't get these things and don't put all those pieces together, then you're losing out and you don't understand. For instance, Romans chapter 3. Now, everybody's familiar with Romans, and I love this passage in Romans where it says, starting in verse, um, let me see where to start here. Notice just verse 20. We'll start there. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So, Nobody gets saved any longer by keeping the law. Now, just give me a second, and I'll explain more of that. Um, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now notice the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of man. In the Old Testament, um, when a man did right, kept the Ten Commandments, when he failed, he offered the sacrifices. What he was accomplishing was his own righteousness. And God honored that for the time. But now, now notice the present day. There's a difference between then versus now. Amen. Verse 19, notice the first word in the verse, now we know. Now we know. Down in verse 20, there shall no flesh be justified. It didn't say there never was flesh justified, but there shall be no flesh justified. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God, not your righteousness, uh, without the law is manifested. Did you see that? There was a day, and there were long days, when uh, the righteousness of man by the law was honored. Men never in the Old Testament got the full-blown righteousness of God imputed to them. That's another thing. Now the righteousness of God. So now is different from then. Now is different from Exodus. Now is different from Deuteronomy, okay? Now is different from Adam's day. Now is different from Abraham's day. Now is different from uh, Noah's day. Now the righteousness of God is manifested. Amen. Now you can have the full-blown righteousness of God imputed to you, okay? Verse uh, 23, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unheard of before in other ages, quite like this. Uh, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Okay, here we go. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice that redemption is in Christ. Amen. That's your standing. He imputed to you, uh, chapter 4 goes into imputation, okay? That's righteousness being imputed to you, inputted to you, it's nothing to do with what you did other than believing. He gave you the righteousness. Amen. It's His righteousness. And once you have that righteousness, it's not going back. Amen. Okay? Um, but it's re the redemption that is notice in Christ Jesus. These words, these little words, all count. Yes. Verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. Okay? That's like a reconciliation. We'll talk more about it later. How? Through faith in His blood. What are you supposed to believe in? The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Death, burial, and resurrection. Right? Uh, but Jesus Christ's blood, which is God's blood, washes your sins away. And you're placed in Him by redemption because the sins are now paid for. They could not be paid for until Christ died. So anybody, again, you're getting into, you know, this versus that. Once again, you get messed up if you say that Abraham was saved like we are. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, he's an example of a man that believed what God said about the stars and his seed, and God did impute that to him for righteousness. That's true. So he's a great example for us in righteousness, and, 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 and rather faith, which gets you righteousness. Problem is, in the next two chapters, Abraham was required to circumcise his sons. Yeah. If the sons weren't circumcised, they weren't in the covenant. Yeah. So again, Abraham's righteousness that he got from God by faith was not a wholesale righteousness like we get. Abraham didn't get all that we got. Abraham still had to be circumcised physically, and his sons had to be circumcised physically. We don't have to be circumcised physically at all. Our circumcision is spiritual, which we haven't even covered yet. But that redemption that's in Christ Jesus, let me continue with this, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Remission and redemption are not the same thing. God remitted sins, and effectively, ladies and gentlemen, this is about, uh, it's like credit cards. You go to Target and buy $4,000 worth of stuff, and you take the stuff home, and technically the stuff's not paid for. Target extended to you credit on your credit card, and until you pay off that debt on your credit card, you technically don't own that stuff. So the Lord, on credit, forgave men's sins in the Old Testament. He remitted them. It wasn't until Christ died for our sins that those sins were paid for entirely. So that's why the redemption in Christ Jesus is final, because the blood washed them away. And by the way, when I got saved, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when Christ died, all my sins were still in the future. So I grew up and at 10 years old, I was born at 10 years old, I got saved. And it wasn't just my sins that I had committed that were forgiven. But all the sins that I would commit. Amen. Because he placed me in Jesus Christ. I am in Jesus Christ's body. Amen. I am part of him. And when the Lord looks at me, even though I did this, I did all my sinning after I was saved. Basically. Okay. Uh, Ten years old, there's only so many things you've done, <laughs> right? And by the time I was 20, oh, man, I had done a lot more things. All right? The Lord forgave me all of my sins when I was 10, Amen. placed me in Jesus Christ, imputed God's righteousness to me. And so now I effectively stand before God sinless, regardless of what I've done, as long as I'm saved. Okay, now again, this plays into this whole thing with tulip and perseverance of the saints. And yes, a Christian should do right after he's saved. He should. I was 10 when I got saved. The preacher didn't do me right. <laughs> he didn't disciple me. We didn't have any discipleship classes. So I wasn't really reared up in a strong Christian home. We were Christians, but not strong Christians like that. So here I was saved, but still living wrong, okay? Um, a Christian should live right, because a Christian should learn, should grow, and all those things, but I didn't, and some of you probably didn't. Probably, probably some of you haven't the way you should. So um, nevertheless, you're still as much a son of God as before, because you have a standing in Christ. Your state, you still may be stupid. You still may be ignorant. Your state may be backslidden, right? And these guys are wrong when they say that if you don't live it, you're not really saved. That's not true. Because, again, this flies into two natures, old man, new man, right? And so, again, what you have to understand is that these separate things flow into other things. Eternal security, standing state, you have two natures. There's an old man, there's a new man. If you don't get these things right, you don't see that there was a salvation then versus a salvation now. Versus a salvation, by the way, that shall be. Salvation in the tribulation is not the same as now. 
Salvation in the millennium is not the same as now. Salvation out in eternity is not the same as now. But once again, we're different because we're what? Part of the body of Christ. Okay, so again, you were baptized into the body of Christ. You're Christ's bride. Now think about the Old Testament. Did you know there's two bridegrooms in the Bible? God, who was married to Israel and is now divorced from Israel and will yet marry Israel again. And then there's us. We're the bride of Christ, and Christ hasn't married us yet, but we're going to be married. So even out in the millennium, here we are. We're still Christ's bride in the millennium. Our salvation settled. Um, in the Great Tribulation, we're getting out of here because we can't still be here in God due to Israel, what He's going to do to Israel. Really, that's the key to knowing the pre-trib rapture is right. The Lord has to get His bride out to judge her and marry her while all this tribulation stuff's going on because it has nothing to do with us. In the millennium, uh, that has nothing to do with us. We're serving under our husband, Jesus Christ. In eternity, when things are going on, we are still in Christ. Meanwhile, God is still dealing with nations that are still mortal, still have physical bodies, even out in the millennium and out in eternity. But you're still the bride of Christ. You're still something different. This flows into division, right? Division. One thing doesn't equal another. Old Testament salvation does not equal New Testament salvation. New Testament salvation in the church age does not equal tribulation salvation, which is also New Testament salvation. There's more categories in the New Testament than you. There's a tribulation still coming. There's a millennium still coming. There's eternity still coming. <laughs> This is just the beginning. Amen. And so, again, if you can't, you know, if you don't have enough building blocks to build on this foundation we're laying, then you're just throwing rocks on top of each other. And some of them are not even, and some of them are not round. Your wall's going to fall over. Your doctrine's going to fall apart yep. because you haven't made sense of it, because you haven't built line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, I've rattled on for a little while here, so I've got to keep rolling. Let me show you something else here, if I could. Um, let me take you to Ephesians chapter 1, because we're talking about your standing right now in, in Christ. I'm trying to expose you to a lot more than you're probably absorbing, uh, although you have a head start because you've heard some of this before. So, praise the Lord for that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, notice this. All right, notice 11, talking about Jesus Christ, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now notice this theme. Verse 1, faithful in Jesus Christ. End of verse 3, in Christ. Uh, verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him. In him, in him, in him. Verse 6, we're accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, in whom... We're in, verse 8, verse uh, 10, might gather together in one all things in Christ, even those things even in Him at the end. Uh, it's all through Ephesians. This is your position. This is where you are now if you're saved. Amen. You're in Him, and you're not getting out of Him. Okay? So what I was looking at here is verse um, 11, in whom also... We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom, that's where you are, in whom also ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Yeah. In Christ, in Christ, you are sealed. Amen. Think sealed, stamped, <laughs> are sealed like a pickle jar. Yeah. 
whatever you think, but that's not all of it. Look in chapter 4, verse 30, Ephesians 4, 30. These words matter. Don't let somebody change a buy or an end to a buy or a buy to an end because you're destroying the limb that you're sitting on. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay? Didn't we just cover and say we were already redeemed if you're saved? Well, what that points to is that there's two redemptions. You're redeemed in Christ, your sins. Meanwhile, once again, two states, or, or two, two natures. Sorry, not two states, two natures. This didn't change when I got saved. And so I'm saved now and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But this hasn't been redeemed yet. And so we're waiting for the redemption of the purchased possession. Okay, that's important because it's an important division. There's still two natures to you, spiritual and physical. And because of that, there's two redemptions, spiritual already accomplished and physical that hasn't been accomplished. One day you're going to put on incorruption for this corruption. You're going to put on immortality in place of this mortal. You're going to die. If he leaves you here, you're going to die, and the worms are going to eat you. So I'm going to be cremated. Oh, good. Now you're just a handful of ashes. And by the way, they have to grind up your teeth and your bones in a giant coffee grinder. I'm just saying, it's true. It's brutal. Either the worms get you or you're ground down to nothing. But then the Lord comes back and gets you out of that, Amen. brings you back with Him spiritually. Amen. You zip down into the ashes and uprises this body Amen. that is immortal Amen. and incorrupt a bull. It's not just incorrupt, it's incorruptible. Yeah. Amen. I could stand here technically incorrupt and still be corruptible, yeah. but that body is incorruptible. So there's two redemptions. If you miss standing and state behind me, you've missed a lot, and you don't understand. Okay, but you're sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. Now, please let me just emphasize once again, these words are all different because the meanings are all different. Okay, if you don't honor the words God used, then you have no way for God to define what He means by those words. There is not a doctor, a dentist, or a psychiatrist in this town or a scientist that would allow you to go in his files and change uh, his, the wording and the paperwork that he has in those files. There's not a lawyer in this town that would allow you, being a non-lawyer, to come into his files and change words so you understand them better. You know why? Because those are legal terms. Okay. Add thou not to his word, lest the Lord reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Yeah. Why? Because every word of God is perfect. Yeah. And because God imparted specific meanings to those words, and where he uses redemption, he means something different than remission. Right. Where he says propitiation or atonement, he means something different than just being saved. Yeah. It's, uh, it's different truth. These terms are specific. And you have to honor the specificity or you are not a Bible believer. Right. And so where you have a King James Bible defender that stands up and says, oh, I believe the text from which the King James Bible came, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then proceeds to tell you how you should understand your Bible in different terms than is written, he's teaching you in your mind anyway to doubt the Word of God and to correct it. And so pretty soon your thoughts are going to be foggy on this because you can't trust God for what He said. And pretty soon you're going to be doubting those words. And you're going to be an ignorant Christian because you don't know the, specif the specifics of what God showed you. Right. See what I'm saying? Let me go on. We'll take some questions a little bit later. Let me just keep rolling here. So we have redemption. Okay, notice Romans chapter 5 real quick. Romans 5. 
and Romans chapter 5. Notice down in, um, why am I having a hard time finding Romans? Romans 5, 9. But you know more than being now, notice the now thing? Well, we saw that real clear in uh, Romans 3, and I distracted myself because there's more links to that. But now, 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 it's manifest now. It wasn't manifest before. It's revealed now. It wasn't revealed before. Okay? But once again, verse 9 much more than being now justified by His blood. Well, somebody in the Old Testament could not be justified by the blood of Christ because the blood of Christ hadn't been shed. So you're justified in Him. Keep rolling. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. All right, Ephesians 2. You know what you were? You were a bigger mess than you thought you were. Um, I'm not in Ephesians yet. Verse 1, you hath he quickened. So there's another thing that he did. He quickened you, right? I'm not going to write everything on the board because I'm running out of board. <laughs> um, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's where you were. You were dead spiritually. You were in worse shape than you thought. You didn't know you were dead. Three, two, wherein in time past. Now, where were you in time past? You were in Adam. Uh, you were where? Dead in your sins. God looked at you when you were lost and said and saw a dead man walking. He was in Adam. He was in his sins. He was in his trespasses and sins. And if you died in your trespasses and sins, you were going to hell. No matter how good a person you were, because you had not had the imputed righteousness of God imputed to you. The only way you get that is by faith, right? Amen. Wherein in time past, in your sins, you walked according to the course of this world, and didn't you? Yes. World ta- uh, set the beat and set the cadence, and you marched to it, yeah. right? You went Friday night to the bar when he said go to the bar. You rooted for your favorite team when they said root for your favorite team. You pretty much marched along like a cow. <laughs> you were herded along by the devil, by this world, by the world's shepherds, like a beef cow. You're just part of the herd. Verse uh, 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Well, that's, that's the devil. Uh, you were marching to the beat of the devil and didn't know it because the devil is the god of this world. That's where you were. You were in worse shape than you thought. To the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What were you filled by? The spirit of the devil. You were devil possessed. He possessed you. And the truth is, even though some would never admit it, they thought more like, they think more like the devil than they think like God. Might be a decent man, might be a good father, might make a good living for his family, and still think more like the devil. And still have his thoughts run more by the devil than by God. All right? According to the court, uh, prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. Where? In the lusts of our flesh. That's where you were. You know what ran you? What you wanted? Your passions. Your little low, vile, vulgar, <coughs> adulterous passions. You liked what you liked. And your taste changed through the years, and probably you got worse and worse as you went along. You walked according to the lust of the flesh, um, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature children of wrath, even as others. That's why being natural doesn't work. Well, God made everything in nature pure. No, He didn't. What He made pure 
became impure by sin. And so just because you were the natural man, you were going to hell. You didn't have to commit adultery. You didn't have to commit murder. You were going to hell because by nature you were a child of wrath. You were born wrong. So verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, that's where you were, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Okay, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ, you're standing, you are in heaven. You're seated there. So how does that work? Well, Christ is the head of the body, the church. You're part of His body, right? Amen. Okay. Christ is the head of the body. There's Christ, our head, sitting in heaven. Um, we're part of the body, and we're still down here. Yeah. Now, think about this. You jump in the creek, and uh, you're this deep in water. Are you still above water, or are you below water? Above, because your head's up, right? right. You're not drowning. <laughs> I'm in heaven because I'm in Christ's body, and He's seated up there. He's my head. Amen. People, you're already in heaven. Amen. So once again, here we are, uh, standing in state. Uh, two natures. You're still stuck down here in the same body that you've been in all this time, in the midst of taxes and liberals and fairies and everything else, <laughs> being frank. <laughs> Meanwhile, your standing, your standing is in Christ. Amen. That's where you are. Uh, let's, I started to dance there for a second. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not missing something. All right, then notice Romans 8. Romans 8. All these things are things that you have in, in Christ, specifically in Him, and they relate to your standing. Okay, Romans 8. Well, preacher, I just think you can still be lost again. Well, why do you think that? Each of these things points out that you can't. If you need more help, then notice verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of God, Christ? Okay, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Now this is Paul's persuasion. This is not just some dork on the street. This is the apostle of the Gentiles who is now persuaded. Wonder who persuaded him. <laughs> the same one that's trying to persuade you through him. I am persuaded that neither death nor life. You can stop right there. Tell me something that's outside of death or life. Isn't that pretty inclusive? <laughs> okay, neither death nor life, nor angels, good angels, bad angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So tell me what's outside the bounds of things present or things to come. It's pretty inclusive. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in a certain place. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, you uh, have the love of God. Is this getting too low on the board for folks to see down there? Uh, Pastor, do you know? Okay, I need to go back to the top. Okay. I'm going to erase state for now. We're going to still talk about it, but I'm going to erase it. Okay, the love of God. It's irreversible. Not because, I mean, you know how we are. Well, 
well, I fell in love with her, but then I fell back out of love. <laughs> That's not how the Lord is at all. Right. When he, when he, by the way, if you're not in the love of God in Christ Jesus, you're not loved by him. Yeah. Right. Now, God so loved the world, right. and God commended his love to us, yeah. and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God does not love a lost person because that person is not in the love of God. God has commended His love to him. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. If you're not in the love of God, in Christ, God hates you. He's going to send you to hell. He made a provision for you, and you turned it down. So now you get to go be with your father, the devil. That's, look, smiley face, God loves you. No, he doesn't. Technically, God loved you, commended his love to you. If you rejected his son, he doesn't love you. You're not in the love of God. And I know that we, I, I, it's still right to stand on the straight and say that God so loved the world. Yeah. God loved you enough to die for your sins on, or to send His Son to die for your sins on the cross. Yeah. That, there's nothing wrong with saying that. Right. But it is misleading to tell somebody that's lost God loves them because yeah. He doesn't. Because the love of God is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, since you're there, since you're in Christ and you're in the love of God there, what can separate you? Yeah. Name something that's not mentioned. <laughs> yeah. You can't name it. Yeah. You can't name it. And so once again, here's this whole stand. Do I look like a child of God? Do I look, do I, do I look as like a son of God? No. This is, my, this is my standing here that you're seeing. And uh, this is my state here that you're seeing. My standing is perfect in Christ. I am standing. Uh, my standing is in Him perfect, perfectly righteous, when he sees me, he sees his son's righteousness Amen. on me. Amen. Yet here I stand, uh, a wretched sinner. I had to repent of stuff this last week before coming here. <laughs> wow. yeah. How does that make you feel? <laughs> it makes you feel preached to by a sinner. That's what he is. But he's in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I got those things right. right? Don't worry. It wasn't anything like you might, what you might be thinking. I like, you know, didn't kill anybody and don't have a girlfriend, okay? But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, standing is a wondrous thing. Uh, again, all these things, I mean, um, the exactness of words. That's the real key here. If you don't believe these words and exactness, if you're flippant about changing how things are phrased, about putting in synonyms, or what you consider a synonym. Funny, God may not have considered that a synonym because it's a, there's a distinction. Redemption is not the same as remission. Being saved is not the same necessarily as being born again. So these things are all important. Okay, we've got to keep rolling here. Look in, oh, I like this one, Colossians 2. Colossians 2. All right, Colossians 2. And so far we're covering everything that is in Christ. 2. Oh, uh, let's go ahead and read of verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you, because you can still be spoiled. There's your state. You're saved, but you can still be spoiled. Spoilage, think. Three week old spaghetti. Still in the fridge, growing green stuff. Okay, that's spoiled, yeah. right? Yeah. Ever take a swig of milk that was spoiled? Oh. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's spoiled. So uh, in your state, you can still be spoiled. You cannot be spoiled here. Amen. This is set in stone. He set you apart. He sanctified you so that you can't be touched. Your standing in Christ is inviolable. Yes. Can't be violated. But, but what else any man spoil you through philosophy? There's a good place. And vain deceit. 
after the tradition of men, Catholic Church, Lutheran Church, Presbyterian Church, uh, evolutionists, college kids, sodomites. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in Him, there's the key, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So let's get that straight. Christ was God, is God, Amen. manifest in the flesh. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all God. There is an order in the Godhead. God is first, the Son is second, the Spirit is third. But the Holy Spirit is as much God as God is. Amen. And Jesus Christ is as much God as God. The Father is. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You say, oh, I'm a JW and I just don't understand it. You don't want to understand it. I don't understand it either. I'm standing before you as three men. Body, soul, and spirit. And yet you see one. Okay? You're created a tripart being like God is. Verse 9. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him. I'm going to save that for a minute. Just, just hang on. Which is the head of all principality and power in whom, in Christ, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The Old Testament, obviously only males were circumcised. In the New Testament, everyone is circumcised in Christ that is saved. Okay, what is this circumcision then? Well, Abraham's was only a foretype of the real thing. Okay, it's an operation. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hand. So there you are. Has nothing to do with following through physically. It's like baptism. Uh, physical baptism doesn't save you. Physical communion doesn't save you. You've already been saved by believing, and you've already been baptized into Jesus Christ spiritually before you get baptized in water. You've already been a partaker of the bread of life and the blood of Christ before you ever take communion. Those things reflect spiritual realities that have already taken place in your life when you trusted Christ. That's why you have to be saved before you get baptized. That's why you have to get saved before you take communion, right? And physical circumcision has no, there, there's uh, no positive or negative to it, okay? Any, and spiritually at all. Physically, if the doctor says so, fine. You follow your conscience with that. But circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And so what does this do? In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ performs the circumcision. It's a spiritual circumcision. And the circumcision accomplishes the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. Um, you know how you sin? You sin through your body. The flesh is the avenue of all your sins. You see, oh, no, no, I, I sin spiritually sometimes too. That's still the flesh. Did you notice that in Galatians 5, the flesh, uh, one of the works of the flesh is witchcraft? Okay, that's spiritual. Idolatry, that's, that's spiritual. Um, the reason you're still a sinner in state is because you haven't been separated from this flesh yet, fully. And so anything that tempts you to sin is fleshly, even if you don't get gook on your flesh. <laughs> it's still, the, the avenue through which the devil approaches you is always fleshly, okay? So what the Lord did since the flesh is the problem, what does that point out? It points out the two, the two standing versus state, two natures, new man, old man, okay? The devil's going to always approach you through the old man, the flesh, the old nature. Still fallen, Still hasn't changed. You may have uh, refurbished it, quit smoking dope and got a haircut, started cleaning your armpits. You refurbished it, 
But it's still the same flesh, and it'll still spoil you. Spoil you. Okay? So he puts off the body of the sins of the flesh. It's called a circumcision. So a scission is a, you know, incision. It's a cut. Circum is around. All right? So he went around your body, between your body and the spirit and the soul, cut the flesh free. So now when you sin, the sin which comes to you through the old nature, through the flesh, does not vilify the soul and the spirit. Because the, the, he views the flesh now as separate. There's a, there's a gap there. Okay, I go to the fridge. No, I, I like ice. I'm from Texas. So ice trays, right? <laughs> like that. And the ice is free in the tray. If you turn it upside down, it'll fall out. Okay? That's like the circumcision. Once you go like that, even though the ice cubes don't fall out, they're still in the tray. But there's a tiny separation, and the ice will fall out if you turn it over. (laughs) Okay, that's what the Lord did for you in a circumcision made without hands. He put off the body of the sins of the flesh. So while you don't notice the gap, to him the gap could be 10 million miles because now when you sin in your flesh, it doesn't contaminate your soul or your spirit anymore. And so you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and it allows that you can never uh, corrupt or contaminate your soul and spirit again, even though you're still a sinner in practice. In practice. State. State. I'm still pointing back here because I think state's still up there. Um, so that's cool. Um, I might as well just go ahead and do it since we're here. Verse 10. Now, where are you complete? You are complete. Okay, so what's left? Look, you're as saved today as you will ever be. Now, your body is going to undergo a transformation. But spiritually, you will never be more saved than you are today if you're saved. Because he said it's finished. And I mean, when Jesus Christ said it's finished, he means it's finished. Because then he rose from the dead, ascended up on high, led captivity captive. And now if you believed in him, you are complete in him. There is nothing left to be completed. You are already a son of God. Okay? There's there's an adoption of the body yet to come. There's a redemption of the body yet to come. But you are complete in him. Who is the head of all principality and power? So once again, standing state. Once again, two natures. You're still stuck here with this stinking flesh. It's uh, still a, a living sewer. Uh, but uh, there's a part of you that's complete. Amen. And uh, I have preached to fundamentalist crowds that are waving a King James Bible and, yeah, we're, we're with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said something about the circumcision made without hands, and immediately the shouting stopped, and everybody goes, You know the, the look a, a puppy gives you when he's confused? <laughs> like that? I mean, everybody's shouting and screaming, and all of a sudden they go, like that, because I've never heard it taught among fundamental, independent King James Baptists, fundamentalists. It's taught in our crowd. So again, folks, uh, what you have to see with this is how, you know, uh, Swiss cheese-like folks are doctrinally, even sometimes when they're King James. Because they're King James because it's the right stance to take, traditionally. But as far as knowing what's in the King James Bible, they're taught what the Bible says by their professors, and they're still teaching what they were taught the Bible says by their professors. They have not advanced for years. And if somebody like you dares to shake their little boat and say, oh, there's a circumcision made without hands, they go, 
What are you talking about? It's true. Um, Notice Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. You know what you are on your worst day? You are blessed in Christ. You got cancer? It's going to kill you eventually if the chemo doesn't get you first. I've known some folks, including my mother and father, that went through horrible stuff with the chemo. And no matter how bad it gets, and no matter how bad the kids get, and no matter what falls apart in life, you know what you still are in standing? You're blessed in Christ. You might starve, conceivably, physically. Um, All kinds of scenarios. You may wind up in prison. You may wind up in solitary. You may wind up in a place where you're lice-bitten and moth-eaten and just a shadow of yourself. Think about the concentration camps. And I hope that's not coming. (laughs) But in the day that you're in the floor of a solitary cell uh, and haven't eaten in six weeks properly you'll still be blessed in Christ. Amen. Okay? So, it's no small deal to be in Christ. Uh, So again, standing state. Your practical state, your natural state versus your spiritual state. And most Christians don't get it. They just don't get it. Um. Notice Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Okay, I press toward a mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Not a low calling, a high one. Everybody has it equal. Everybody's just as called as I am. Uh, every, every Christian has a high calling, okay? It's no cheap, small thing. It's no small deal. In Christ Jesus, you have a high calling. Notice Ephesians, I'm sorry, I should have t- kept you there, Ephesians 1.11. Ephesians 1.11. Keep it in mind now, all these things are separate things, right? You just didn't know what you had because uh, you hadn't been taught the language. Ephesians 1 and verse 11, in whom, again, uh, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Okay, now don't read Calvinism there, okay? But in Christ, you have an inheritance. Now, think about this, and this is another Bible study, and I'm just going to hit it, okay? Okay. Um, Even in this world, there's two types of inheritances. Um, You know, if my dad were rich, he probably would leave me some money that's guaranteed. Now, if, say, he was a uh, CEO of a big corporate entity and owned it, and um, I was a, a son that hadn't pleased him, had shown no interest in the business, he's probably not going to leave me that business because I'd run it into the ground if he's smart, right? Um, But he might leave it to my brother who's shown a proclivity to it and is interested in it. So there's a part of our inheritance that's untouchable. As far as I can tell, you can't lose your mansion, right? As far as I can see, there's a part of your inheritance that's put out of reach of anything, anybody that's insulated against anything that you do. You're still going to be a child of God. You're still going to inherit uh, the kingdom of God. But uh, let me just show you one verse. Colossians, since we're near, 3.24. There's also a part of the inheritance 
that is a reward. Knowing, verse 24, knowing that uh, of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Well, what's that for? Well, verse 22, servants obey all things your masters according to the flesh. I know that's a cultural issue now, but it still says what it says. And um, not in eye, with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. He goes on to tell the masters in 4.1 how to treat their, let's face it, bondservants. I'm not trying to go back to those days. I'm just saying the Bible acknowledges them. And so there's a part of the inheritance that's earned as a reward. There's a part of it that's guaranteed as a son. So what the judgment seat of Christ is going to show is the rewards you lost or didn't accomplish because you didn't serve Him. So some of it can be lost, but you still have a guaranteed inheritance in Jesus Christ according to Ephesians chapter 1. So you are heirs. And the one reason we serve is to be yet greater heirs. Heirs, not errors heirs to inherit, right? Okay, notice Galatians chapter 2, Galatians 2. Galatians 2, 4, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in to privily to spot our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. We have liberty. The Old Testament saints did not have liberty. In Christ, you have all these things. In Him. It relates to your standing. The Old Testament saints did not have liberty. They did not have the liberty to break the Sabbath day. And if they did, they could be stoned for it. And should have been. David did not have the liberty to commit adultery with Bathsheba. And he should have been killed for it. Do you know there's no sacrifice in the Old Testament for murder and for adultery? What was supposed to happen to you was that you were to be executed. And thereby dying in your sins and going to hell. You, had, you didn't have that liberty. Okay? Well, now we have liberty. And so um, let me just show you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 12. All things are lawful unto me. You mean, preacher, that somebody can commit adultery and still go to heaven? I don't believe it. Well, how does committing adultery affect? Standing. How does it affect state? Oh, it does. Okay? I mean, you wind up with bad diseases. <laughs> you made horrible decisions. You're, that's, you're gonna, you're, I mean, uh, you're going to wind up in a mess, right? But in your standing, we have liberty in Christ Jesus, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Okay, so a Christian should live right. Because when you don't, you subject yourself to having, having something that has power over you. Look, you shouldn't smoke. Or else the cigarettes are going to get power over you. And every time, you know, the little cigarette calls, smoke me, smoke me. And you have to leave and go outside and go smoke. It's, it's uh, you're subjecting your life to something. If you allow yourself to get off into gambling, pornography, et cetera, et cetera, that eventually if you keep on feeding it, that dog's going to eat the white dog. Yeah. All right? <clears throat> but you have liberty. Look in chapter 3. Chapter 3. Where's that other... Oh. No, I think it's chapter 10. All things are lawful for me. Where's that? Yeah, chapter 10, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 10. 
verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify, not. I ought to have a higher vision for what I'm doing and whether it might edify you or hurt you if I do it. But I have liberty. Okay, we have liberty in Christ Jesus. Liberty is supposed to be used for is, okay, I have a standing in Christ. I also have a state. When uh, I sin, my state is that I've messed up again. And I have liberty to not be damned, get back up, and fight another day. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's liberty, okay? You do commit sin in your state. It doesn't destroy you. He doesn't kill you. You can repent, restore fellowship, get back up, and go on. That's liberty, okay? All right. So there's more to come, but these are the things that you have in Christ. Now, there's a couple other categories we have to go over tomorrow. Um, again, I can only emphasize that all the things that this folds in. Again, um, you've not replaced Israel. The church is a separate entity from Israel. God marries Israel again. Christ marries the church. Two distinct bridegrooms. Two distinct brides, okay? Two different natures, standing and state. Two different places to be. I am two places now. I'm in Christ, and I'm standing right here, (laughs) okay? Um, Salvation now versus salvation then. Nobody has ever had what you have in church history. Prior... Uh, For the last 2,000 years, for the last 2,000 years, nobody has ever had what you have. This is the Cadillac of all ages. Born again, eternally secure. All these things teach eternal security individually. All of these things individually guarantee your eternal security. None of these things can be reversed. Nobody has ever had it like you have it. I'm going to take you to Colossians once again. Colossians is a treasure trove, brethren. (laughs) Colossians. um, Let me show you something. Okay, notice what he did for you when he saved you. Uh, Verse 13. Colossians 2.13. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I hope you can see that (laughs) you start digging in here and there's just layers on layers on layers and this is related to that over there and that over there. And all of a sudden, things start coming together in your Bible instead of clashing. It's like fitting like a glove and boy, this fits now. This works now. Fundamentalists don't have a Bible that works. I'm telling you, there's contradictions in their Bibles because of the way they perceive it. And they will just out and out deny certain things are true. The same is true of mainstream evangelicals and Christians in general. They don't have a Bible. They don't believe the Bibles they have speak to definitive, narrow meaning. It's all a generic gobbledygook. Oh, we're forgiven, and God loves us all. There's much more to it than that. Okay, here's what I want to show you. Keep talking myself into other subjects. Sorry. Verse 13, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you know what that is now, and now you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, right? Hasn't anything to do with a knife cutting anybody. This is spiritual. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. The law used to be against you. And now which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross, the law is nailed to the cross. It's dead to you. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them, 
the principalities and powers in it. What's that mean? That is the slam dunk of Jesus over the devil. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, it's the end zone dance. It's Jesus Christ making a in-your-face show of the principalities and powers, the darkness, Satan and his minions for your sake. Now, let no man, man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, so don't even approach me about me needing to be right with God by not eating pork. Yeah. Just shut up. <laughs> I have the liberty to eat it, and I'm going to eat it. Amen. Okay? Be thankful for it, all those things, right? Yeah. Let no man spoil you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day. I don't have to worship on your Sabbath on Saturday. No, I do not. <laughs> okay? The reason we worship on Sunday is that's when Jesus Christ rose. Okay? Amen. And uh, do you have to be here? No, you don't have to. Right. But you should. Amen. Okay? But don't be judged by that or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So that as far as holy days are concerned, okay, uh, you, know, you do what you want to do with Christmas, do what you want to do with Easter, but I'm not obligated to go to your party, and I'm not a, I'm not a non-Christian because I don't go to your party. And because I don't sit on Santa Claus' lap, it's probably good. But importantly, do not, do not, for all the joking, miss verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come. What that said is that the holy days, the meat, the drink, the restrictions of new moons and Sabbath, that's coming back one day. It's going to come back in part in the trib. It's going to come back in the millennium. But, more importantly, but the body is of Christ. You know what he just said? He said, you are a different animal. He made you an exception there to all these other things. Because you are in Him and you are baptized where? Into His body. And the body is of Christ. So the body is exempted from drink regulations. I'm not talking about alcohol here. Drink regulations, meat regulations, Sabbath regulations, Holy Day regulations. Because you're an entirely different beast. You are Jesus Christ's wife. God's wife is going to have to keep these things. But Jesus Christ's wife will never have to. Amen. Okay? Totally separate thing. So, what questions do you have? Hey, preacher. Yes, sir. I, I've got a, a few questions uh, that I've had that I know that they've asked me, and you've touched on them very briefly. So, when you discuss about... When you discuss about Old Testament, New Testament salvation being different, how do you handle yes. such things as Abraham rejoiced to yes. see my day, he saw and was glad, Hebrews 11, uh, and such like? How do you handle yes. them? What are you talking about in Hebrews 11? What about Hebrews 11 about by faith, by faith, the emphasis on faith. Yeah, okay. Abraham saw Jesus Christ's day and was glad in Galatians, right? So talking about Isaac on the altar. Well, Isaac was a great type of Jesus Christ. And the Lord and Moses, uh, Abraham saw the Lord's day and was glad because he saw in his son a type of what Jesus Christ was going to do for us literally, right? But as far as seeing Christ dead, buried, resurrected, and ascended, that's not what Abraham saw. See, how do you know that? Because the apostles didn't know that. And did you notice that every time that Jesus Christ said, you know, I've got to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer and be tortured and I'll have to die, and uh, Peter just, you know, just split his gown, man. He had an aneurysm. That's not going to happen to you! <laughs> well, these guys knew to ask righteous questions from the Bible, but they were completely oblivious to the idea that Christ would go suffer, die, be buried, and rise. So that's not what Abraham saw. He didn't see the Christ dead, dead, buried, resurrected, and therefore Abraham believed that and was born again. He couldn't be born again. Look, if you will, in John 7. Look, if you will, in John 7. There were things 
I mean, if you don't think that Old Testament righteousness was different, just go with me here. John chapter 7. And notice verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So he's talking about the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit coming into a man and all the things that happens when the Spirit comes into a man, right? We are placed in Christ, sealed by the Spirit, right? Okay, but notice, this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on Him should receive, so they hadn't received Him yet, right? For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, there you have the, uh, the end of the, the, the bookend. He's telling you there's things that cannot happen until the Holy Spirit is given, and the Holy Spirit cannot be given until I'm glorified. Christ had to rise and ascend back to heaven. And Pentecost had to happen before the Spirit was given. Therefore, nobody before that time could be born again. Nobody before that time enjoyed the total righteousness of God through redemption and imputation. That, we'll cover that later. Nobody in the Old Testament was any of these things. David had to pray and say, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay, you can lose your fellowship with God and your fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But He's not taking Him from you. Amen. He's still in you till the day of redemption. Amen. Salvation in the Old Testament was different. Salvation in the Old Testament was about your righteousness uh, serving as a band-aid until real righteousness could be imparted to you through God. I always think of it as a tourniquet. The law was given and all of the sacrifices, all the bloodshed, because the shedding of blood of bulls and goats, what? Cannot take away sins. Now, that blood served as a remission of sins. God allowed that much. But that was a tourniquet on a wound that was going to bleed you to death. And so He let the law serve that way as a, as a bridge measure until His Son could come and die and finalize things so that now uh, you're totally justified, your sins are totally redeemed, and you've been imputed the righteousness of God, Amen. and you stand today perfect before God spiritually, yeah. but not in state. You're still stuck here yeah. in state. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Tulip? Yeah, yes, sir. That was from yesterday. Calvinism. Okay? Uh, T stands for total depravity. A Calvinist thinks that you are so totally depraved that you can't believe even if you wanted to. Okay? It's nonsense. Well, here's the Lord all the way through the Bible saying, believe, believe, believe. Have faith. Do this, do that. And what they essentially believe, folks, and this is, sounds kind of crazy, they essentially believe that the Lord has to save you, regenerate you, before you can believe, because you're so totally depraved. Does that match with anything in the Bible? Sure, you're, to you're totally depraved in the sense that you're depraved, yeah. But it's not in totality. Because God kept imploring folks, do right, do right, do right, believe, 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 uh, to people that weren't born again. Okay? Unconditional election means that God, without condition, elected some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. So there's nothing you can do about it. Even if you were elect to go to hell, even if you wanted to get saved, you couldn't. Because God unconditionally elected you to go to heaven or hell. You say, surely they don't believe it that way. Well, they don't state it that way. 
if that's what they believe. Right. Limited atonement, that Christ's death for you on the cross was limited to only the people that he would save, yeah. to those that he had elected to be saved. And so the sins, he did not die for the sins of the whole world, he died for the sins of all the world that would be saved. It's wrong, yeah. right? Irresistible grace. I commented on this is stupidification. <laughs> that a man who is uh, uh, elect by the grace of God cannot uh, resist the grace of God. Who here has resisted God this week? <laughs> right? It's complete ignorance. I mean, it's completely stupid. How, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that uh, killest the prophets and stonest them that I have sent unto thee, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. I wanted you to come, and you wouldn't come. How's that irresistible? <laughs> Stupid. Yeah. And finally, perseverance of the saints. Uh, that is, if you're saved, you will effectively do right until the end of your life. Because if you did wrong, uh, that would prove that you weren't saved. So in the end, that's not eternal security to a Calvinist. That's just another form of work salvation. Your works prove that you're saved. And we talked yesterday, as much as I wish they could, I mean, we all look, when somebody gets saved, we all look for fruit in their lives. And everyone should bear fruit spiritually in their lives if they're saved. They should. But what if the flesh gets the better of them. What if they don't grow? The fact is, um, your works do not prove your salvation right. or disprove it. Right. I was as backslidden as I could be and saved. Other people do right, and you'd think they're saved. Yeah. But if they can never tell you that they were born again. Yeah. So... As bad as it's, it's kind of painful to say because we all look for fruit in people's lives. And, you know, uh, to people you know very well, you know, look you're around here at people you know here, and you probably have real firm assurance that you guys are saved because of fruit you've born, right? Yeah. Still doesn't prove it because it's all by faith. So, perseverance of the saints is not eternal security, okay? Perseverance of the saints knows nothing. Calvinists know nothing of this stuff right here. They know nothing. Never discussed. They don't get it. Anything else? Yes, sir. And you've got that in 44.7, is that what you said? Yes, Isaiah 47. Okay. Oh, excuse me, 45.7. 45.7, okay, I was going to say, I was coming up with that. I was going to see if I had a cross-reference here, but I form the light, create darkness, I make peace and create evil. Sometimes evil in the Bible is sin. Sometimes evil in the Bible can be shown to be, I don't have a cross-references here, can be shown just to be bad things happening. Okay, the Lord does allow bad things to happen. Actually, the Lord was the instigator of what happened to Job. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yep. Hey, Satan, where you been? Yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? Yeah. And the Lord picked that fight. Right? Yeah. In a way, he was the instigator of that evil. The Lord was the instigator of the evil that overcame Jesus Christ yeah. on the cross. It was his plan. So while evil often does involve sin, there's also a different aspect where sometimes it only means that bad things that happen. So in that regard, the Lord does create evil. Now, the Lord does not create sin, right? right? But as far as engineering that some bad things happen, what happened to Sodom was pretty evil. Yeah. It's pretty bad because yeah. they were evil. But that was the judgment of God. That was a bad thing happening. 
Does that answer that? Was there another part of it that you needed me to answer? Because I'm not sure I answered your exact question. Right. The idea of, it, of evil is what we think of. Right. Here, the, the idea of evil recommits the act. Right? Because Adam and Eve only sinned when they ate of the tree. They ate now right. what they ate in, and now we're sinning. Right. So you're asking, essentially, is, is God the author of sin? Right? Yeah. No. That's what it becomes, right? Mm -hmm. Philosophically speaking? No, no, I'm not saying that. I understand, I understand. Okay. Yes. So evil was already there. Right. Right? How can like evil was there? Like, couldn't everything be still already? Where we have it's kinda of like that's kinda of like falling along a little bit. Um, I think that that's one of those things that, you know, honestly, omniscience, God knowing everything, omnipresence, God knowing everything, God being eternal. Look, there's things that we accept but don't truly understand at length. <laughs> right? Because you can't. You're not going to get your head around God at knowing everything, past, present, and future, and essentially being timeless and not being restricted in time, how he knows the future as well as the past. You don't get it, okay? Again, I think there's a distinction between evil that's sin and evil whereby bad things occur, okay? The Lord created things pure and right. He did not create sin, but he also gave men a choice. He gave the devil a choice. He gave his created creatures a choice. The devil led a massive rebellion of not only himself, but angels that fell with him, the angels that sinned. Each of those angels chose to go against God. Okay, that was evil. Um, God didn't create the evil, but God allowed the evil to happen. A perfect man, a perfect woman, in a perfect garden, a perfect place. Uh, didn't even have underwear to wash. Right? And the Lord doesn't create robots. He wanted Adam and Eve to love him of their own free will. So in allowing that to be the case, he had also to allow them to do wrong if they chose to. Now this kind of bleeds over into philosophical stuff. It gets kind of kind of hefty, right? In the end, there's things you have to just accept that God is not the author of sin, but He still allows evil to happen. And sometimes there's a difference between evil being sin and evil being bad events, including judgment that happens. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Because I'm glad. <laughs> Right. So in the book of Mark, uh, chapter um, 14, and it's uh, verse 50 to 52, uh, 51 and 52, um, it says, And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast by his naked body, and the young man laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Mm hmm I've a certain man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's all you know. Uh, it could have been Lazarus, because Lazarus had been resurrected from the dead, and they were seeking to kill him because he overthrew their party, the Pharisees. So it could as, as well have been Lazarus as anybody else, but there was nobody specific, uh, specific that was mentioned. So I guess I wish I knew, but I've never heard a definitive answer. And uh, right. And what are you doing with just a bed sheet around you and you're naked? What are you doing? Did you just get up? Whatever. But uh, I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows. I never heard anybody give a definitive answer for that. Yep. Yes, sir. I'm not 
Okay. Yeah, say that one more time. Just I'm sorry. So no, that's good. I just want to share a verse with you. Yep. Okay. Right. So that evil is God's judgment on sin. That's not God doing wrong. That's God bringing. No, you're good. Right. Yeah, again, again, it's just, to me, it's the distinction between evil being sin and the Lord bringing bad things, allowing bad things upon somebody. That's not sin itself. Um, it's the Lord allowing you to get cancer or somebody to get cancer. Uh, that's viewed as evil because it's bad. It could also be a righteous judgment of God, of Sodom. And an evil thing happened to the Sodomites. I mean, it was a bad thing, but it was not sin. I think the distinction is sin versus bad things happening. It's 1134. Okay. All right, praise the Lord. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you for a chance to do this this morning. An hour and a half went by pretty quick. I pray that you'll bless. Let us finish tomorrow in a substantive way, trying to keep a lasso around this so it doesn't get completely off kilter. But I pray you'd guide us and help us, and we look forward to it again tomorrow. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Appreciate it.